We are taking your reactions of uh, the recent uh, petrol souvenir where the corporate has just been uh, granted bail in the sum of two million naira and uh, two sureties in like sum. So let's quickly get your reaction on this, uh, Ibemere. How would you react to this development so far? All right, for me, it, I, I think it's a fitting follow up to what um, we had termed an irresponsible act the last time we gathered there. I think that was about two Sundays ago. Uh, that was the very first time this uh, issue was being approached. And coincidentally, I was, I was on the program on that day. And we roundly condemned you know, what had happened. So I think that this is a fitting follow up um, to a, a very irresponsible act on the part of someone who you know, took some, something for, uh, for, for granted. It's very clear that she has contravened um, the laws of, of the state. You know, in this case, the environmental law. So it, it's nice that she's she's been she's been made to face face the law. We we'll see how well that goes, uh, so that it serves uh, as a, uh, an example to those who might want to take laws in, into their hands. Mm. So, but Babajide, do you think perhaps this action will perhaps by the government will necessitate any behavioral change? Because I understand, even if this is a souvenir, you know, mm. that she got for her friends. Most Nigerians, most of us are known to buy petrol in kegs. Yes. You know, so does this really change anything, if I would say? Let me start with that. It changes a lot. and Our conduct was downright irresponsible. Very, very irresponsible. I don't know what the point that, what the work points you wanted to make. In any case, even the traditional title that they gave her was uh, given to her by a traditional ruler. A controversial traditional ruler in Ogun State. So why come to Lagos to endanger our lives? Lagos has not recovered from uh, from NSAS, NSAS destruction up to today. And you go into a packed hall where people are likely to be smoking uh, shisha or smoking cigarette, and you thought it made sense to distribute uh, petrol in such a place. It, all it all all that is needed is for a spark fire. to happen, and the fire, the, 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 the fire will consume everybody. I mean, some Nigerians sometimes want to do something uh, really um, surreal, something uh, unusual, mm. but that's taking it too far to go and share petrol to people in a packed hall, and the the um, the, the regulatory officers of Lagos State also did not do their job. Because even in this season of COVID-19, they ought to be on ground, make sure that people abide by the uh, uh, COVID protocol on social and physical yeah, distancing, yeah. ensure that people use their uh, face, mask. face mask, and then wait there to ensure that compliance is maintained. Where it's not maintained, they have the right to come in and say, look, gentlemen, this party is over. But... How come in such a famous hall mm. this whole thing happened and nobody tried to stop them? There's no evidence that anybody stopped them. And the organized, I mean, the, the owners of the event the center itself were also irresponsible because they shouldn't have even have allowed them to bring in this combustible material. Mm. That way we joke too much in this country. We joke with virtually everything, including our lives. This is what we are seeing. You know, as, as, as serious as this, this might be, the, the offenses, are, according to the police, are punishable under the laws, yes. the legal state environmental laws. But, you know, do you would be even beyond uh, the okay. environmental laws, yeah. they found uh, reasons to charge her. Okay, but give us a sense of the kind of penalty that should be meted out on this kind of case. Okay. The police said the offenses are contrary to and punishable under sections 2JI. Uh, CD 168D and 244 of the Criminal Law of Lagos State 2015 and Section 195.2B of the Environmental Management Protection Law of Lagos State 2017. So I don't know uh, what punishment uh, this particular uh, portions of the law prescribe, mm -hmm. but I know that they found. Um, enough reason to 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 charge her they are even they even charge her for uh, unlawfully carrying on the business of storage and containerizing petroleum product without a permit hmm. you know so it is when they want to leave you alone that they, they will find something 
uh, with which to charge you. They're taking their time to, to examine the case. To, 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 yeah, to look at what she has done and look for um, a way to ensure that she does not uh, escape justice. Mm. Final thoughts on this, Sam? Right. The, it's, it's said that uh, the will of you know, justice grants uh, very slowly. Mm. Um, we want to see how this case you know, pans out. The Lagos State government is very interested in this. I, I am particularly impressed by the speed at which it's responded. Initially, you know, uh, the people out there thought it was going to be one of those things, but sooner than we have thought, uh, the case is before the, uh, the, the, the courts. Court, and yeah. uh, it will be nice to see how these things pan out. Mm. I'm sure uh, the sanctions, um, as um, stated in, in the laws, will, will allow to take its, its, its course. Right. It appears armed bandits terrorizing northwest and north central Nigeria have relocated to Kebi State. Well, in a fresh attack on the northwest states, bandits killed several people, including police officers, in Gaski and Gafara communities of Gaski local government area. And confirming the latest attack, a member of the House of Representatives from the state, Yusuf Tanko Sumunu, said the bandits had sent a letter that they would attack the community hosting a tomato processing factory. Meanwhile, bandits also killed a divisional police officer, Umar Darkin, and six other persons in Nasco, Magama, local government area of Niger State. And the bandits who invaded the town, one on more than 100, 100 motorcycles, were sent straight to the police station and killed the DPO, after which they murdered five other vigilante group members. But today, this can be very worrying because I know we've talked about um, insecurity for far, you know, almost on a daily basis on this show. But how do you feel about this incident where the DPO, police officers, and vigilante members were also killed by the bandits? Yes, the, the DPO had, pr had clearly been giving them problems. You know, the bandits struck sometime last week in the same area and to, to an extent they were resisted. What they hate to see is vigilantes confronting them, taking from them cattle that they had rustled. Whenever you do that to them or even kill one or one of them, they will come back with maximum force. That's why you saw that even in Kirby State, about 63 vigilante men were killed. Whenever they see these vigilante men, they always respond with uh, extreme anger. And that's what has happened. The, the DPO was killed, was the ADC to the immediate past governor of Kirby State, that Saidu Dakengiri, hmm. is uh, the, the late DPO uh, was uh, Umar Mohamed Dakengiri, clearly from the same town as the former governor of the state. So they, they, they attacked the town, Nasco town in uh, Magama uh, local government of, uh, of uh, Niger State. Uh, people remember Gado Nasco, who was the uh, FCT minister for many years. That's his hometown. He has a big farm there. And these days, bandits have been attacking that local government, as well as the uh, Rijau local government that shares the border with Kebi State. Mm. So they move from Niger into Kebi. They've not really set up a permanent camp in Kebi, but they are constantly moving from Niger into Kebi. Then through um, Zamfara State, they also come into Kebi State, carry out their attacks, and then leave. So this is what they are, they are doing, and it is suspected that it is Dogo Gide, the bandit leader, that is carrying out this attack because he was one who um, carried out the kidnap of those federal government college students, hmm. and then decided to marry off some of the girls to some of his fighters and all that. On social media, we had stories that Dogo Gide had been killed, but this is a lie. Dogo Gide is not dead. The same way that uh, uh, Kachala Turji is not dead. So there's nothing that we gain by publishing lies that 
these bandit leaders have been uh, have been killed whereas they are still killing our people they are still killing our people and they are even expanding their frontiers because as i said uh, uh, a few days back even local governments in niger where in the past we were not experiencing attacks they are now being attacked by these people even the highway the Suleja mina highway that for a long time we didn't experience any attack because uh, the airport in Mena hardly functions except maybe the, uh, some big people are organizing something and then they come with their private jets. That highway is what people going to Mena, they use, I mean people going to Mena from uh, Abuja, that's the highway that uh, they ply. Now bandits are uh, attacking that place and even are um, kidnapping people who are walking on the on the highway. So this, this this thing is getting worse, and we need an effective response before these guys uh, finish killing our people. What kind of effective response are you looking at in this regard, Baba Didi? It is the military campaign has to be coordinated. And our response to attacks by these people has to be swifter. Sometimes they operate for over an hour because they even want, they want to burn down an entire community. That takes time. But we are unable to respond quickly. Okay, um, now school, for example, is not far from Bogu. And I understand that even the Air Force has an outpost in Bogu. The Air Force has uh, a base in Kainji. So this, this is still within the same state. Mm. So we should be able to respond appropriately when these things happen and uh, visit the violence that these people deserve upon them. Sam, you know, in as much as a lot needs to be done to contain the security situation that is already upon us, the bandits threatening security of an agrarian state like Kebi leaves one to, you know, worry what could happen because a majority of our food comes from there. So what Absolutely. are the likely implications of this? Of course, we, we've talked about um, uh, lack of access to the farms. Um, and we know what the implications are, you know, for in terms of uh, food security. We've talked about that. Uh, only recently we talked about uh, inflation, you know, you know, on the backs of fear scarcity. But even before then, we had talked about inflation on the, on the backs of... Uh, on the back of... Uh, uh, food challenges, you know, food insecurity and, and all that stuff. So that's the basic uh, 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 challenge we are like to face because of constant, you know, um, attacks by, by bandits. KB is just one. You have Niger, you have Sakoto, you have Zamfara and the rest of them. And this, you know, uh, challenge appears to be festering all over the place. Mm. So yes, the, the, the immediate impact of this is that uh, most of our, our brothers and sisters who live off the farms cannot cannot visit those places. Um, of course, you, you recall that um, even those who attempt to go to the farms are taxed. They have to pay before they can harvest and all that. And that's not good. It, it just speaks to the ri rising anarchy in, in the land. And we ask ourselves, how long you know, yeah. can, can we sustain that? Mm. It, it's a major challenge. You, you, yeah. you talked about um, what can be done. GD has, GD has, you know, um, reference them the need for us to you know have an all-out attack against against these people we need we need something a bit more coordinated we need to make emphatic statements about this we talked about KB if if, uh, if you recall where 18 soldiers were killed in one day the day the deputy governor was attacked six police officers that is 24 security personnel were killed in one day and we ask ourselves what has the military response been and that's why these guys are emboldened all right if, if there had been an immediate response to it, they probably wouldn't, wouldn't come back to go visit um, um, a, corporate, a corporate organization, mm -hmm. you know, to want to take you know, the entire place out. So there has to be that quick, that immediate quick response, response, you yeah. know, in a way that right, the, right signal, the right signals are sent to them. Otherwise, they just keep doing what, what, whatever they think you know, is, um, is, is in their own best interest. Which is to take take control of these ungoverned territories and continue to visit, you know, um, mayhem upon upon our brothers and sisters who live up there in the north. Mm -hmm. So, for for me, what we are seeing in Kebi is probably, you know, um, 
uh, a response, or um, not, not the response in this sense, you know, it's a, if an effect of probably what the military has been able to accomplish in places like Zamfara, mm. Niger, and Sokoto. Mm. That's why they're heading towards Kebi. But again, we have to find a strategic response that can take them out right. you know, from, from, that, from that territory. Right. So that when they leave Zampara or leave Sakoto or leave Niger, they have no place to go. So we have on the phone Sadiq Abubakar and he joins us from Niger State. Please go ahead with your contribution. Hello, good evening. Good evening, you're live. So we're having uh, the problem that we're having in our own zone that is uh, Zone C. We call it Zone C. Because Niger State has been categorized into three. We have Zone E, we have B Zone. We have some C. That is where His Excellency, the present executive governor of the state, is from. So what happened is today in Magama is something that has been happening. Those areas are we are having control local government, Magama local government, then we are having boundary with Shanghai local government of KB State, that is uh, with uh, Magama. Then we are the having sharing boundary with Zuru local government, the same thing with uh, Sakaba, that is Diri. So it is their root axis, those bandits. So that is where they do follow, they will come and do their things. Like now, as I'm talking to you now, there is one word that they are calling Genu Ward in the local government. They were there and presently, nobody was inside that village. Everybody has run away. The same thing with Warari Ward, the same thing with Shambo Ward. Can you confirm so for us if there's a level of security presence in, in those areas you've mentioned? To be candid to you, if say they are coming from axis of Sakaba, that is boundary with Niger State, there is one village that we call Inana. These two men calling, phone call. They will be calling, telling people that they are coming. People of that Inanna village will be calling people from Warari, from Shambo, from Genu Ward, as they are coming. Then those people that I'm telling you now, they will keep on calling those big people that they know. In terms of our security, like local government chairman, the police, and what have you. But to be candid to you, you can't see. They will pass for more than two, three, five hours before you see security. Hmm. So we don't know what is happening. All right, thank you very much for sharing with us uh, the latest happenings in Niger State. Let's quickly move on to our next issue of discussion on journalists hanging out for the conference of Nigeria political parties, CNPP, an injury to one is ultimately an injury to all. Now, the leadership of the CNPP has commended the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, for foiling what it called the coup against Governor May Malabuni's chairmanship of the Caretaker and Extraordinary Convention Planning Committee of the All Progressives Congress, APC. In a statement signed by its Secretary General, Willy Ezugu, the CNPP noted that all lovers of democracy must commend the intervention which resulted in the U-turn by the presidency on the matter. The CNPP urged the APC to end the confusion in the party and be an example of due process in effecting leadership change at all levels. Meanwhile, efforts by the APC to set aside the November 18th, 2021 order of Justice Bello Kau of the FCT High Court stopping the party's March 26th National Convention suffered a setback. Well, due to rightful legal representation of the party and the matter has been adjourned till March the 17th. Babajide, now let's look at this issue regarding the APC's internal crisis. You know, with this situation, how do you see this affect in the party's chances in the 2023 elections? Do you think perhaps the party, the party is ready for what is ahead? Well, um, the party still has time to resolve all these uh, outstanding issues and get itself prepared uh, for the election. It's the ruling party. Um, it's in control of um, a clear majority of Nigerian states. So it's still the party to beat in the election. I'm not saying um, that uh, whatever happens, it will win the election. No, but it's still the party to beat. It's the ruling party. Um, so, these issues 
within the party are issues that they can resolve. If they are able to hold um, the convention and a new set of leaders emerge, then some of these issues would be put to bed. Um, some of them permanently, some of them partially. So what the party needs to do is to um, be conscious of the fact that it has to abide by the law at all times. So that what happened in Zamfara and even uh, River State will not happen to the party again. The party is supposed to learn from its adversities, mm. you know. But clearly some members of the party, because of their hunger, their desire to hijack uh, leadership uh, for the purpose of using it um, to advance their own interest um, during the 2023 election, they are now trying to bring the party down with them. So, uh, in, to an extent, I think the INEC saved APC from a potentially combustible situation because what INEC has done is simply to remind the party that, look, there are rules and the constitution of our country recognizes only the chairman and the secretary of the party. And by the same token, INEC rules recognize the chairman as well as the secretary of a party. So whatever correspondence they have uh, with INEC, if May Mala Buni's signature is not passing through that correspondence, if um, Udo Edehe's signature is not passing through that correspondence or that document, INEC will simply not accept it. The way it is, it is only the recognized leader of the party, for example, that can legally present someone as the candidate of the party. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. So if someone else does that, of course, INEC will respond in the manner that they have responded. So, um, May Malabune, in my view, has just a few days left been there for almost two years. So they need to manage the crisis very well at this time and ensure that there is no serious issue that crops up before the March 26th convention so that there can be a, a proper transition from this caretaker and convention organizing uh, committee hmm. to another set of leaders um, elected by the people uh, on the floor of the convention. Right. So, Sam, do you share the same sentiments or you have a different opinion or what, are, what would you rather add to the, those gray areas if the APC needs to look into if it is to go ahead with this convention on March 26th? I share, I share GK, I mean, um, GK, uh, GD's uh, sentiments. I mean, all that has been expressed is basically, you know, around the issues of, of law, you know, and the need to be, you know, what, what, the, what, the, what the rules are, you know. Um, the shocking thing for me is that it took INEC to remind, you know, the APC leadership that, in, that indeed they were about breaching the law. So it's, um, it's um, uh, a big one for them. O otherwise, it could have been a dangerous sleep. So they have a chance in the next uh, nine, ten days or thereabouts, you know, to put their, you know, their house That's in order. Exactly. But again, um, knowing with politics is played in this part of the country, uh, yes, it would seem that APC has a breeder, but I'll be surprised, you know, that we don't have issues, you know, even in the days ahead. It would seem that uh, one party has gained, uh, you know, an upper hand at some point, and then the next, the next time, the other party appears to, you know, uh, be calling the shots as, as it were. So we're likely to see this pushing and shoving, you know, mm -hmm. in the days ahead on, until things, you know, uh, pan out the way they ought, ought, ought to be. Because, you know, we have um, one court case that is yet to be, you know, dealt with. We had there are many more, you know, some have talked about 208 court cases and all that. We don't know, you know, uh, the veracity of that. 
But what is clear is that there are you know, uh, stakeholders within the party who think that um, unless their interests are properly addressed, they, they wouldn't allow that convention to be. Mm. So just about anything could, could happen in, in the days ahead. I, I, I hope that APC learns from the mistake of the past. Otherwise, it could just go the way of uh, the, the country's uh, leading opposition party, which suffered the same, same fate um, sometime in 20, 2015 or thereabouts. So um, politics in, in, in this climb is, is so unpredictable. You know, I have a friend who says two plus two is not four. Because just about anything could happen. There, there is this internal struggle for control of the party, and it's about who, who who gets has, what? Yeah, who gets, not just who gets what, but who controls the, the structure. Because if you, if you control the structure, then you can, you can allocate, you know, uh, resources or power the way you, you want it. And so these contending forces have the next couple of days, you know, to sort themselves out ahead of the convention. Otherwise, you could just have uh, an implosion on our, on our hands. And that's what, that's what I fear, you know. Yeah. So it would seem that things are quiet, you know, um, you have a balance of you know, uh, call it terror as it were, you know. Uh, so we we'll see how, how, how the leadership manages the, manages the issue. Forms are being sold, you know, at what some people call a ridiculous, uh, and a ridiculous uh, price. But then there's also the issue of consensus. You ask yourself, I mean, if, if you are looking at consensus in determining most part of, um, in determining what, what would, you know, um, who gets what at, at the party, then why are you selling forms and all that stuff? So there are a whole lot of issues, and we, we want to believe that the party leadership will be able to address this, this um, worrying concerns, or these concerns rather, and then um, just have a very peaceful convention you know, on, on March 26th. Otherwise, um, and anything that disturbs APC, of course, is going to have an impact on the country. It's mm -hmm. the ruling party. So each time they have these internal struggles, and you seem to have you know, issues here and there. The country appears to also suffer from it. It's just like, you know, catching cold and sneezing somewhere. Hmm. And, and perhaps you'd like to share with us what you think the country might get to, you know, uh, will I say, what, how, in what way do you think the actions of the party, the actions or inactions of the party will affect the country in general? Okay, so the first thing for me will be the fact that we don't seem to have, you know, serious governance going on at the moment. So all attention is concentrated on concentrated on what is going to happen in the days ahead. In the days ahead, you find that most most governors are not are not paying attention to what is happening locally. It's either they are you know spending their time in Abuja, you know, uh, bantering over who gets what and all that. So the immediate the immediate impact is that governance is taking a, appears to be taking a back seat, and that's not good for anyone. And the worry the, the worry is that in the next in the next. Uh, Nine, ten months or thereabouts, you are going to have the same the same scenario playing out, mm. where nobody pays attention to you know issues bordering on on uh, indices of development, you know. But just who gets what, you know, at, at the center, and that that shouldn't be the, that shouldn't be the case, you know. We've had issues around why would the governor leave governance in you know back home and come to Abuja and stay. The one in Niger is also back there, wanting to do the same thing. The rest of them, all the ministers and all that, everybody is concentrated, is, is, seems, to pay, seems to be paying attention on what is going on in Abuja, because that's where it's meant to be. Yeah. So for them, politics is, is work, as it were. And they just want to grab and, uh, you know, decide who, I mean, decide what happens in the days ahead. So Babajide, if, if, if this is all about politics, do you think we can perhaps change the, the narrative of Nigerian politics so that everyone gets to understand that we are here for the good of the masses and perhaps not for selfish interest. Well, the, the politicians have never stopped telling us that they are there for you and I, but we know that um, a lot of them are selfish. We know that they care about themselves, their friends and their family members a lot more than um, they care about even the well-being of the country. But that's the way it is um, until our elections begin to yield a succession of not just capable but selfless and um, and forward thinking leaders 
we, we, we won't get out of the woods. A forward-looking uh, leader, for example, would even get his hands soiled working for the state, working for everyone. But leaders who do not really think about the future, or think of the present, they are going to be busy just uh, trying to position themselves for what, for immediate gain. But you've got to be able to think about where you are going. Where do you want Nigeria to be in the next 10 years, for example? You know, all the plans that we came up with in the past, 2020 and the rest of them, we can't point out what we have achieved with them. And it all boils down to the fact that we have leaders who do not have capacity to deliver um, the actual dividends of democracy. Some of the things for which we praise our leaders to high heavens are things that are taken for granted in other lands. Somebody gives you water supply, supply you know, one kilometer of asphalted road, and you roll out the drums as if um, it's done uh, something, something, like something extraordinary, mm. you know. So we, we, we've really, we've got to so change our focus on... perception might change as well. Yes, we've got to focus mm. on the people. Right. The people must be the centerpiece of governance until we do that. And, and the way we play politics in our country is like a winner takes all affairs, a zero-sum game. People want to hijack the APC completely. They want to be the ones to inherit the party once Baba Buhari leaves office. That's what they are thinking. They are focused on that. And in my view, they are not even people who are ready to let the, the contest be um, a, 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 um, a level playing field. Mm. They don't want the political of the uh, of the APC to be a, a level playing field. They are trying to hijack the party so, so that they will shut out other people from um, um, the leadership of the party mm -hmm. in the post Buhari era. That is what they, they they are planning. Let the convention of the party be an open affair. Right. Anybody who is strong enough, who, who fancies his chances, let them contest. All right, let them contest. So Don't please. impose people on the party. Mm -hmm. When you do that, you are laying the foundation for the for the dismemberment of the party. Mm, indeed. Now, the dependent of our economy on oil means any crisis in the sector will have ripple effects on other sectors. Now, figures from the National Bureau of Statistics have shown that Inflation rose from 15.70% in February from 15.6% in January. And in its Consumer Price Index February 2022 report, the NBS indicates that the highest increases were recorded in the price of gas, liquid, liquid fuel, wine, tobacco, spirit, narcotics, solid fuels, among others. Babajide, let's help us understand this situation. Everyone is talking inflation, inflation. How will this affect the average Nigerian? Let's begin from there. No, it's affecting the average Nigerian. Inflation is something that does not leave anyone behind. No matter how comfortable you are, no matter how rich you are, inflation affects your purchasing power. Inflation affects, if you are a company, you know, um, that's into production, even of merchandise, all kinds of things. Inflation will affect your capacity to make profit. It will eat into your margin. So everybody is affected by it. Look at the airlines, for, lines, for example. Before they raise the alarm on the floor, the, uh, I mean, um, uh, House of Reps, they were already gasping. And if that situation, if that uh, the price of uh, Jet A1 mm -hmm. had been allowed to remain hovering between 670 uh, naira per liter and 700, 700 naira per liter, 
some of the airlines will by now have uh, packed up and that is a very critical sector even when we slipped the two times that we slipped into recession in the last decade the aviation sector as well as the agri sector were the sectors that uh, offered hope those two sectors were um, in credit those two sectors were doing well they were not in the negative like other sectors so that is not a sector that we should allow to die now if you listen to uh, Alan Oyema of uh, uh, Epis he said for for Abuja Kano flight at 700 naira per liter aviation fuel will account for 70 percent of the um of the operation operational cost of the airline for that trip alone mm -hmm. and of course to put an airline in the air is not is not fuel alone that you need absolutely you buy spears, your spears that you buy is with dollars that you buy them. There are other things. You must pay people salaries. Now, if we are alone, take 70%, where are they going to how are they going to make profit? They will die. And that was why they said, look, you've got to save us. Give us a chance to go to even buy, I mean, import aviation fuel on our own. Hmm. Because these guys are not even telling us how much uh, at, at the landing cost, so that we know whether they have uh, in, uh, inflated the, uh, the price beyond. Uh, but normal. let's not forget that the Russian-Ukraine war has also exacerbated things as it is. Yes, because it's, it's a global effect. It, naturally, that would happen any time the price of of, of, uh, of uh, crude oil goes up in the international market, because we are not refining the landing cost goes up too. Right. So once the landing cost goes up, the ordinary folks are the people who will suffer. So that this is what we are seeing. All of the things that we import into our country, because the CBN has also not been able to do anything to show up the value of the Naira. Virtually everything that we import, the prices have gone up. Gone up. See, look at bread. I used to buy bread at two, 250, premium bread. 250 just a little over a year ago it's now about 650 700. 700 so everything has gone up and nigerians are becoming more and more impoverished the imf has warned us that look if we do not take concrete steps to address inflation more and more nigeria will slip below the i mean uh, poverty line all right let me quickly get your thoughts on this uh, sam what do you think the government can do to remedy this situation that we're in presently improve our product, uh, you know, production capacity. But sadly, we visited this on ourselves in terms of the way we have managed our economy. A lot of sentiments, instead of you know, uh, being real to ourselves in terms of what we need to do, we've played a lot of politics. And subsidy is one of them, all right? Only yesterday we learned that the euro bond of uh, about $4 billion that we raised, that we're going to take 2.2 from it to subsidize fair purchase. And that, that just tells you how reckless you know, we have been with, with the management of our economy. That's money that we ought to have put into the productive sector. And we're you know, pushing it to, to consumption. Yeah. So how, how do you explain that? It's, it's almost a vicious circle. We, first, we've got to be real with ourselves. We need to tell ourselves certain home truths that it's either we get it right or we just, we just all go under. Yeah. And that's why you, you, you want to ask yourself, if we were real, why would we be you know, pushing the, the, the implementation of uh, the, the fair subsidy, you know, removal of fair subsidy to sometime, you know, next year, probably to the incoming government. It's just like burying our heads in the sand like the ostrich. Mm. You know, so first we've got to be real. We've got to understand that there are, funda you know, fundamentals that we just can't toy with. For how long more are we going to be taking money, go to, you know, the international, inter international community, borrow money and come back here and then just fritter it? as it were. That's practically what it is. <laughs> so there is no alternative to improving on our productive capacity. Otherwise, our industries will go down. Citizens will also continue to cry because prices will go up. We're 
basically import dependent. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So that's a fine place to leave it, gentlemen. We cannot continue any further because of the time factor. Well, thank you very much, Brother Didier Kolade of Titoju, for your insights on the program. And Sam Ibemere, we appreciate thank your you thoughts as well on the show. And that's about it on Journalist Hangout. Join us again tomorrow for another interesting edition. You can also watch a repeat broadcast of the show tonight at 11. And join us again on Sunday from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. And we are also on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash TVC News Nigeria. Many thanks for watching. I am Esther Mapariola. Bye for now and God bless Nigeria. <laughs>